welcome. Pleasure to have you here. I appreciate it. Those are very kind words. Thank you. Okay. So, we will get on with our business this afternoon. How many of you in the room are familiar with the concept of massive open online courses or MOOCs? Okay, a couple person. I know a little bit. Yeah, I heard of it. Yeah. Okay. And how many of you have ever taken a MOOC? Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yep, I have. Okay. Oh, oh you have? Khan Academy. You did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, no, okay. So. I think she was planted. <laughs> It's always good to have one in the room. And to our, our chat, and it's our chat, really. Uh, and so very informal and cozy and comfy. And uh, so about, I kind of look at the brown bags as a platform to have that opportunity to share with it's true. people. What, what have you been doing? We see you in the classroom, but what else have you been doing? So this is part of what I have been up to for the last little while. So what you see on the slide here uh, is, if you will, the get ready to get ready precursors to MOOCs and how we um, distinguish between distance education and online learning. And there is a, a distinction. You see, sad but true, uh -huh. I'm, I'm old enough to remember television courses. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> uh, and so the, the very early forms of distance education, uh, as opposed to when we talk about online learning now, and virtually all of us incorporate a learning management system, whether it's Blackboard or Sakai or Canvas or Moodle in our, in our teaching. So what you see on the list are, if you will, the, the steps that lead us to where we are with these massive open online courses right now. Okay. Now, interestingly, our, our quick, rather unscientific poll is pretty much indicative of what has happened with MOOCs. When they first came to light, almost, yeah, roughly seven, eight years ago, those of us, with, if you will, within the bubble, within academe, thought, oh, heavens, it's the end of civilization as we know it. We're all going to be replaced by these massive open online courses. Our students will run away, enrollment will decline, and we'll all be out of jobs. Hasn't happened. Hmm. Just like this first iteration of personal computers, we thought we would all be replaced by computers. Well, that didn't happen either. So, why this is the pluses and minuses. Here is how many of them are organized. They typically run between four and 12 weeks. Um, they are open access. They are free, which is wonderful. Unlimited enrollment. Thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands have enrolled for these types of courses. Yes, they are graded, but because there is no formal credentialing like an on-ground course here or a hybrid or an online course here, they don't carry the same weight. The method of, of instruction is not so dissimilar from the things that we do already, particularly in tr more traditional online courses. So the use of discussion boards and and meetups and podcasting and so on and so on. That's pretty much all the same. What we can take away from MOOCs is that yes, you can get a certificate certificate of completion, or you can pay to have proctored exams, and typically they're non-credit. Okay. Now there are some institutions that have made the leap to offer credit-bearing MOOCs. Another way to think of that for us in the US, that would be kind of like AP courses for already matriculated university students. In other words, it's, it's a way to take a course, get credit for it, 
okay, or CLEP, credit by examination. Mm -hmm. So, but not necessarily an alternative to a degree, but they do have, have function. Here's why they're popular. There are things within our society that we don't necessarily need a baccalaureate to be successful. Yeah, all right, let me think about that. And too, you can think about a lot of the, the professions in vocational education. So do you need a PhD in horticulture to mow my lawn? No. Okay. And other, other similar type professions. But a certification is a helpful thing. So this is, this is what has happened. And interestingly, what folks thought let's say six years ago, again, our students are all going to run away, they're not the ones taking MOOCs. It's people like you and me. Say, oh, well, gee, I always wanted to study horticulture, but I never had time. It didn't fit into my major, those types of things. And so, a different collective in the U.S. has embraced these massive open online courses. The other side of the equation has to do with the other side of the ocean. Ah, so a U.S. product that, like many things, we have managed to successfully export to other parts of the globe. And partnerships between U.S. universities and foreign institutions. Uh, a very good example coming out of the U.K. is the Open University. And open, uh, they are an online, and but they have, have broadened their scope to include these massive open online courses with the vision that once they have those students in their palm, in the palm of their hand through a MOOC, they will migrate them oh. in, into their standard curriculum of online learning. And they've been reasonably successful. Uh, there, there are two similar um, situations in other parts of the globe. So that's where we're going. And two, if you've been following things in the Chronicle of Higher Ed for the last little while, you know that our friends in California have enrollment challenges that we would like to emulate. They don't have enough faculty. They don't have enough seats. So students are, are have, essentially have to go elsewhere, out of state, or online opportunities in order to matriculate to university because they don't have the physical space. So this is another application for this type of technology. And then two, we are all married to our smartphones, aren't we? <laughs> Even though we don't like to admit it, we are tablets, and, 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 and this particular platform, I suppose it's kind of the, the double-edged sword, the beauty, the beauty and the bane of MOOCs is that you don't have to be present at a specific time. You can review the podcasts when it's convenient for you, you can chime in on the online discussions when it suits your schedule, in other words, it, it's at your convenience, and no one is, if you will, following you to make sure that you are completing your, your assignments on time, that you're on task, on mission to complete. That too is a double-edged sword, because what we've found is that while many sign up, many enroll for MOOCs, few actually successfully complete them, mm. which, is, which is a bit of a problem. Okay. So here are some of the numbers. And what you see in the list here, Udacity, Coursera, edX, Khan, and Udemy, these are the largest purveyors in this company, in this country, and these are 2015 figures, but these are the numbers of students that enroll in these courses. Imagine. Ten and a half million. 
it's not unusual for these types of courses, particularly um, through and his, uh, out of Stanford, his first MOOC was Artificial Intelligence, AI. And Stanford said, yeah, okay, yeah, fine, go, go ahead and throw it up. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah put it online. Yeah, maybe you'll get a few students. He had more than 100,000. Mm -hmm. Who knew? All right? it's, kind, it's kind of like the rummage sale axiom. You never know what people will buy. And that's what got the ball rolling. And so, so this is where we are. And Khan Academy, uh, they have done incredible things, particularly in China and Southeast Asia. And here's a short list. Uh, there's AI, uh, Thrun's, uh, and two, how can you go wrong with, with when you partner with Google? And then gender through comic books. Ooh, okay, so that would be, you know, if you saw that as a student in a course catalog, you'd say, well, that sounds like fun, but it's not going to count toward my major, so I guess I won't take that. Uh, and then um, X, X Informatics by Jeff Fox of, of IU. Uh, aren't we, and particularly in the age in which we live and recent um, decisions coming from Washington about, if you will, the backdoor codes and encryption with our smartphones, uh, the, ma the math, science, and, and computer code, and, yes, and breaking code, an interesting, interesting course. And then, too, coming out of Australia, yes, computing. And, you know, it's funny. You and I take certain things for granted. We assume that when our students matriculate, that they are savvy just because they can uh, proficiently operate a smartphone, that they understand Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and accessing. Not necessarily true. And so, a very welcome course, and if you will, no harm, no foul if you don't do well. And then finally, uh, astrophysics at Yale. Uh, so, black holes and cosmology, yes, everything Star Wars and Star Trek that, yes, you ever wanted to know about. Uh, and, and then some. And then, two, down here at the bottom, uh, the distributions. So math, computer science, in other words, all the STEM fields are well represented in MOOCs. And two, a very big uh, percentage for the humanities, almost 18%, which we tend to get lost in the shuffle in these types of, of developments. So that's actually, I was very delighted to discover that statistic. That's good, that's good news for us. So you're thinking, yeah, come on, Dr. May, get on with it. How, do, how does this translate outside, if you will, the Continental 48? Here's the proliferation of MOOCs outside our borders. And these are just the partners with Coursera. And this is just in a short amount of time. So we are represented very well in Western Europe. So France, Scotland, the Netherlands, Germany. Uh, Switzerland, um, Scandinavia, Spain, and, and particularly the UK. And two, our, our distributions. Coursera is our largest partner here. They've got the biggest piece of the pie. And they're, depending on your perspective, they're either doing some very wonderful work in the field or they're snapping up a lot of market share and a lot of profit. I could go either way on that one. Depends on, depends on the day and which way the wind blows. <laughs> now, our other partners. So, Academy Q coming out of the EU, uh, open to study, which has done very well in Australia. Future Learn, also UK, and they've been coming on great guns. Two. AMI in Africa, 
and two, it's a little bit difficult to see, but uh, things are things are occurring there, but it's not necessarily concentrated in one particular region of, of the continent. It tends to be very spread out. Uh, a lot of work in Japan and China, and then too, Latin America is also coming on very, very strong in terms of activity with MOOCs. So why this works in the African diaspora? Okay. We have large centers, so South Africa is a good, is a good example where we have many universities and although matriculation is different than here, it's very, very competitive and students have a different mindset with respect to their education. Just because it's government subsidized and much more higher percentage of funds than here, not everyone gets to go. You have to write very stringent entrance exams. Two, uh, it's also post-colonialism, it's British system. If you fail one course one semester, you're done. You're out. You are, you are flat out expelled. There's no such thing as academic probation. Yeah, uh, there is no three strikes, you're out. You're gone, 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 and that's the end of it. And so, it, for, for that reason, MOOCs have been successful in offering an alternative to students that don't make the cut, can't get into university, or those that have managed to get themselves precluded from university. The other thing too has to do with large population centers versus small villages and very rural areas. So when I leave, this will be my fifth trip to the continent. It will be my fifth journey to Botswana. You go from Habanone, which is a modern city, the capital of the country, where we have Wi-Fi and smartphones and the whole nine yards. You go about five miles out of town to the next village, and you see either cement block housing okay, left over from apartheid, or you see corrugated metal huts, and in both instances, you might see a satellite dish on, you know, on the top or not. Um, you also might see solar collectors where folks are using, using those um, devices to get electricity for the homes. In Botswana, the government sanctioned a new university in about the middle of the country. Botswana is about the size of Texas. There's one highway that runs from south to north, from essentially from the border with South Africa to the north, the border at Zimbabwe, it's the A1. Right about so. And two, Botswana uh, is partially desert. Habadonis is on the edge of the Kalahari. The government has sanctioned the, the construction of a new university at a small village called Palapi, which is essentially right about smack dab in the middle of the country, to serve this disenfranchised population, these rural villages. One of the things that they will do, besides traditional, because they only have seats for about 300 students, is they will amplify it with massive open online courses. So, so classroom content modules and those lecturers will go will also launch online. That's part A. Part B. See, we're very fortunate here that we have teaching commons and all types of, if you will, uh, 
in service activities, okay. so professional development activities. That doesn't exist the way you and I know it there. So the other folks that are taking advantage of MOOCs are faculty there in teacher training, okay. uh, in other words, refreshing skills, amplifying skills mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I am collaborating with three universities. University of Pretoria in South Africa, Boto University in Botswana, and University of Cape Coast in Ghana. And we are developing MOOCs in, in all three. At U Pretoria, we are working on a MOOC that deals with HIV AIDS awareness. 12% of the population in South Africa is affected negatively by HIV AIDS. This course, when we, get, when we finish it, will be incorporated into the university's core curriculum. Every student at UP will have to take this course. And it's not, it's not necessarily about safe sex, but it's also about how, how do you accommodate someone who is HIV positive in the workplace. The healthcare issues, the employment issues, <coughs> the educational issues, um, if you will, the empathy, okay? so the, the sensitivity to those people, um, resources. So it, so that's one of my collaborations, and I'm very fortunate to have wonderful colleagues there. In Ghana, we have teachers that are in rural villages that don't have certain uh, resources available to them. One of the big difficulties there has to do with uh, mental illness. And so that, that spectrum. So we're do, we are designing a MOOC that will enable teachers, so primary and secondary school teachers, to very quickly identify students, for example, that are ADHD, uh, that are high functioning autistic, that ha have other uh, Challenge. Yes, other challenges, other cognitive difficulties. So that's what we are working on there. Uh, mental health uh, resources, very, very small in Ghana. So it's another way that we can fill a need. And then my colleagues and, and I in Botswana, uh, we are in the process of designing a massive open online course that will address employability. There are a lot of talented folks that don't have the skill set to successfully interview for a job to fill. Okay, so basic stuff, things you and I take for granted. Mm -hmm. So, how to, how to successfully fill out a job application, to interview, to write your resume, um, to explore opportunities. So these, these are, are three of the things that, that I am working on, and two are the areas, so healthcare, teacher education, and two, also in South Africa and Botswana, uh, finance. Uh, if, if, you, if your area is international finance, you can go to Africa and pretty much call the shots. You can pretty much name your own salary. And so, credentialing for accounting and finance is huge, and they can't meet the demand traditionally. So they are, that's uh, AMI, uh, the Accounting Management Institute in Africa. That's what they are working on in terms of MOOCs. So, but, thinking, yeah, you're doing all this great work. And just, just as the work is great, and there are folks that are on board, okay, there are folks, too, that are also, well, a little um, skeptical. 
and that's natural and un under understandable. And you know, we are all uh, cognizant of the biggest fear in life, which is that of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My, ver my very first presentation in Africa about online learning, some of, the, some of the audience members said, well, that can't be as good as face-to-face -face learning. So how do you get over that hurdle? And there's a certain uh, amount of reticence with massive open online courses as well. So these are some of the things that if you will keep folks awake at night. <laughs> And two, we are also creatures of habit. You and I are accustomed to a 14-week semester. We know that our midterm is going to be about seventh week and a final exam in the 15th week. When we start to change that up, we get nervous. Okay. And two, we have, and our colleagues uh, in the African diaspora, what exactly constitutes a learning space? Are we in a conference room? Are we in a classroom? Are we outside under an acacia tree, hopefully not sitting on needles? <laughs> um, you know, where, where is that? Um, and interestingly, too, I had stories from colleagues there that they had what they call kiosk campuses, kind of like pop-ups in, in the rural uh, areas. They would, um, it would be like us opening a campus for a couple of weeks in a, in a strip mall. So taking a rental space. And they were online classes, yet the professors would actually drive up there and sit and wait for students to drop in. Instead of, why aren't you checking with them online? Oh, no, 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 that's not good enough. That's, on one hand, you're going, that's laudable. You want to be present for your students, but you have technology that can facilitate it, so why not? And two, our roles. You know, we are all guilty of holding on to stuff. Okay. It's, 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 I can, yes, I can hold on to my water bottle. And I'm not necessarily, yeah, I'll offer it. No, I won't. Yeah, OK, well, I'll offer you a sip, but I'm not giving you the bottle. We're very good about that when it comes to our teaching as well. And being able to, to if you will, to release and let go and become more of a collaborator, a facilitator, a mentor with students can be challenging for some folks, particularly those that have come up through the British system of tertiary education. In other words, when they went to pick Cambridge, Oxford, wherever, the dons were wearing their regalia. And there was more than six degrees of separation. Mm. And so, may, things that you and I, if I if I came to class in my regalia, my students would howl. Mm -hmm. So very, very different. And then once that, yes, and once the tears stopped flowing, and then maybe we could settle down and get, and get on with some business. But that formality, and, and two, that's one of the challenges, again, post-colonial Africa is different. And this idea of, of shifting power. So some of the concerns, and two, yes, will it be as good? How do we, how do we deal with plagiarism and, and cheating? And two, corruption? <laughs> Or anti-corruption is very, 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 very huge there. They are very, very concerned and very, very careful and thoughtful about it. So we have means. We have software. Yeah, cool. There's an app for that. We can we can take care of it. Uh, will we become less than the academy? And will we become like we talk about the for-profit institutions? Here, some of which have uh, incurred the wrath of the Justice Department for for uh, some of, of well uh, their duplicitous exploits. So, will, yeah, will we become? Will, yeah, okay. A friend who 
spent time uh, teaching over there, had to get a physical in connection with work permit. Walked into, into the physician's office in Halberone, sat down, here's my medical form. Physician signed it, said 150 pula, which is about $15. Aren't you going to examine me? You look healthy. 150 pula. Okay. All right. Ooh. And so that type of that that type of thing goes on, but it got yeah, concern. So how do we be diligent and not become exploitive? And then how how do we adapt? And then numbers. So how, how do we keep our, not only our enrollments high, but successful completion? And that's a challenge. So certainly there's a need for what I call urban planning. But here's the plus. It's a way forward for us to be better. To not, to not settle for good enough in our teaching, but to be better in our teaching. Okay, to, and two, to, to engage our students in myriad ways that are going to foster learning. And two, just as we learn from an instructor, we also learn from one another, what we call second order learning or lateral learning. And so I have learned much from my international colleagues, whether I'm talking with colleagues in Ghana or South Africa or Togo or Zambia or Nigeria. They all have something to bring to the table in terms of, of our educational processes. And they, and they provide insight into in terms of not only subject matter, but if you will, the, the administrative side of what we do as educators that I haven't even thought about. And two, how we mine talent. My very first trip to Botswana in 2012, I was so impressed by one of the keynote speakers that said, we are not going to graduate employees, but employers. That's a big distinction. And candidly, I hadn't thought about it that way. You know, in, in humanities, we, th we think, particularly in music, okay, we're going, to, we're going to graduate a music education major, we're going to get you placed in a K-12 public school somewhere. We never think collectively about we're going to graduate you in music education and you're going to form your own school. We never make that leap. With performance majors, yeah, we're going to graduate you and we're going to give you the skills to pass an audition and uh, gain a seat in a symphony orchestra. We never think about that entrepreneurship component if we're going to graduate you with not only the skill set to play in a symphony orchestra, but to start one and make it successful. So that too is, is a very fine reason for us to, to be open globally and to have a very wide cross-section of individuals in these courses, because absolutely, we learn from one another, and two, how we network. It's something else that we tend not to think about. So when we go to the classroom, it's not, and it doesn't matter whether it's a MOOC or an online or a hybrid or a traditional, it's not so much about the matter at hand. Okay. Um, let's see, when I, when I go back to class, I'm going to lecture on Scott Joplin and Bessie Smith this afternoon. But besides telling my students about the contribution that they made musically, 
I'm going to talk about the time in which they lived and how entrepreneurial they both were in their work and that that's a wake-up call for my students to do likewise. So in these very large open online classes, you're going to meet people that you would never ever meet otherwise. And it's an excellent opportunity to expand your own network. And how we, how we keep things fresh and move forward. Because no one wants to be stale. No one wants to be yesterday's dues. No one wants to be the has -been. That's why these were not what we thought in the beginning. Oh, yes, they're, they're going to transform higher education and we'll be out of jobs. They're going to transform higher education and they're going to enrich our jobs. So thank you so much. Thank you. Open for questions. Open for questions. Now you're all like my students. You're right. Church. <laughs> yeah, when push comes to shove, you're pushed. What I'd like to ask you, I, mean, I shouldn't talk, I have to please say another question. In the, the project you're doing in Africa, how, talk about how you, how you got into that, because you talked about the skepticism there. You must have partners over there who've been working in this and who see this as a possibility to expand education without degrees, but in terms of knowledge dissemination. You know, I'm a huge believer in providence and serendipity. Okay. Which I suppose is a nice diplomatic way of saying you kind of fly by the seat of your pants and things happen. Uh, my first trip to Botswana uh, in 2012 was for the university's actually inaugural international research conference and the theme was online learning. Oh. Okay. They are wonderfully forward thinking. They view in this country our youth consider sports and being a hip hop artist, not necessarily in that order, the way up and out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. They don't okay. They don't necessarily think that if you have a bachelor's in accounting is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Not not if I could not if I could be a, ba a basketball or football or soccer star or yeah I can be the next you know pick the next Kanye West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They'd rather go that route as opposed to for your education. Young people in Africa, and by comparison, Africa is a very, the population is very young. Mm -hmm. Their view, they view education as, if you will, the way up and out of poverty and disenfranchisement. And so, the way to make it happen from a university standpoint, they can't, they can't reach all of them in the classroom, but through online learning, they can reach more. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how the whole thing started. So I came for the first conference. They asked me to give a keynote. And then we had, had discussions. We organized a partnership between here and there. And then we started collaborating. What can, what can we do together? Mm -hmm. So what can we do to facilitate online learning? What can we do to facilitate uh, expansion of, of the curriculum? Um, what can, so very, very forward thinking, very, very progressive. And interestingly too, things happen very quickly there, rapid fire succession. When I was there that first trip, they were using Moodle, which is Moodle is shareware. And it was not efficient. And that was a recurring theme during the conference. Uh, oh, Moodle is, ah, okay. So in other words, yes, they, they were not happy with Moodle. I said, well, do you want to see my Blackboard course sites? I'm happy to show them to you. And so I, I 
get demonstrations of, of my course sites. By January, they had signed on with Microsoft and Blackboard, and they were up and running oh, yeah. second semester. Ju just based on, well, here's how, here are the capabilities, and this is how I use the platform for, for my teaching. And they, unlike here, they are well resourced. So, so it was a case you of. You mean universities are well resourced? Yes. Oh. So, yeah. So the ICT uh, dean walks over to the, the vice chancellor and says, We need the software. And the vice chancellor says, Well, what do you think it will cost? Give me the numbers and get a timeline together and we'll get it done. And they did. And they went to the Ministry of Education and they said, So, how much will you give us? And the Ministry of Education said, So, are going to use this both for teaching and for research? Oh, yes. And the government kicked in the balance of what they needed. Mm -hmm. And this happened in three months. What country was this in Botswana. Botswana. How, why, why are they so well resourced, the university? Botswana is one uh, of the top three in terms of GDP in mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, commodities? Uh, diamonds. Yeah. And, and tourism, of course. I mean, that's really yes. with you know, ecotourism. Yes, ecotourism. But the diamonds, the yes. diamonds, yeah. Oh. So yeah. They, they are. Uh, they're, are if you will, as my granny would say, they're well fixed. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and very, very savvy. I've been fortunate to have met the Minister of Education uh, and at research there. They want their young people to succeed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's top down from, from the country's president. So, so that's presidential mandate, and there you go. Uh, yeah, like like uh, like Moses, right? So let it be written. So let it be done. Yes. And yeah. that's that. And everybody buys in. And are these forward. administrators American trained or British trained or in the West somewhere? Right? Probably. Many are British trained. Yeah. Uh, in Botswana, in the university system, so for example, Boto, which is where I will be, uh, they were originally uh, Indian, NIIT. Uh -huh. okay. And so there, there's a large uh, Hindustani population as, if you will, at administrators. And there are also expats from the UK and right. Australia yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that make up, along with uh, African uh, administrators. And two, interestingly, many of those that are native to Africa, um, so South Africa, um, Zimbabwe, um, Namibia, Zambia, the, the region, uh, that, that many of them have taken their training here and gone back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so I mean, I'm meeting people there. Oh, I did my undergrad at Ohio State. Oh, I did my undergrad at Michigan. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's it. But one of the fears with international exchange from there is that their students will forget to come back. Yeah. Questions? Please, I mean, these are, are four questions, I, you know. I have one. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, I've taken a MOOC before, now that I think about it. It's for a sociology class through e, ed, EdX. Bye bye, thanks for coming. Um, but um, I think university, one of the universities in Illinois is um, offering their entire MBA program online. For free as a move or whatever. Yes. Really? Uh -huh. Yes. And it's a legit. It's legit. It's not like a. I forgot. I'll tell you. Okay. But um, <laughs> their only record. Their only requirement, of course, is that you get you have your undergrad, and then you are enrolled 
You have the option of having it for free. And you have the other option where you pay $20,000, which I'm sure even for an MBA is relatively cheap. It is, but that's credential. Probably yes. without the $20,000, you are not going to get the credential. Right. Yeah, that is yeah. cheap. So, right. yeah. so my question is, say you decide to go for the non-credit way. And you got the, and you're going through. You completed this, this this MBA education. How does that look in the outside world? Like when you're trying to validate and you state your, oh yeah, well I went, I have an MBA and so and so. But you know, how does that work with the credentials or the accredite accreditation accreditation? Excuse me. Good because I would love to do that myself, but if it's just like more or less a line of bragging rights, well, we can't really, we can't really ascertain where you got your information from. Okay, you got it for free, you know. Many of the universities, us included, when we saw the proliferation of MOOCs, the view was, okay, we should, we should have some type of credentialing system in place just so we can, so we can accept this coursework. So similar, uh, similar in manner if you took coursework, let's say you had an associate's in accounting from OCC or McComb. Mm -hmm. And you have a reciprocal relationship, Wayne and McComb, like we do with our criminal justice program. So, okay, you've got associates in CRJ from McComb. Yep, you can just carry that over. We'll accept all of that. And then, yes, you can build on to your baccalaureate without retaking two years' worth. There's similar credentialing for these types of programs with MOOCs. And the one that you're mentioning is really quite new. Um, and that kind of sent some shockwaves through uh, the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Yeah, it would, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, for the forums page is like, how can they do that? And the, the reason it will work, so, yeah. you're thinking, aren't they going to lose money? No, they're not going to lose money. So the content is there. They're just o uploading content, which, which is fine. And two, just like other MOOCs, there'll be an outrageous number that sign on. Yeah. Then they're not all going to finish. They won't all finish. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's not really going to be that much out of pocket for them. Now, well, and two, that twenty thousand is probably the cost to proctor all of the exams yeah, yeah. and give you the credential, in other words, the, cert okay. the certificate of completion that you can take to the admissions office. So, so it's really just a matter of getting a certificate of, of completion, not a, an actual master's um, degree. Mm -hmm. With the program that you're talking about, you will have to stack up those certificates of completion, successfully completed, let's say for finance, accounting, uh, management organization, theory and development, um, corporate social responsibility, whatever, whatever your, your core curriculum is, then that collective of certificates will so proctored exams and successful completion certificates for those courses are going to net you the degree. I suspect, though, there's probably some kind of an exam like we do with a master's and that's some kind of comprehensive yeah. to yeah, pull all that together. So if you've gotten your certificates and there's not substance in it, you won't pass the comprehensive. Yes. And I can see where for $20,000 they could do that, really. Because you don't have the classroom, you don't have the bodies in the class, the faculty in the classroom. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and you don't have the physical space. So, Absolutely, yeah. Yes, so in, yes. ter in terms of resources. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, the out-of-pocket for the university. That's fascinating, yeah. really. And I think they just 
they I heard about it like maybe a little less than two years ago, and I think they're starting this year. Oh, that's just or next year, very yeah. very soon. And yeah, I I remember seeing the the online forums in in Chronicle of Higher Ed, and and yeah, people oh, yeah. people were nervous. Were nervous, yeah, yeah. Well, other questions. We thank you. I know you've got to go and teach. Thank you. I found this quite quite enjoyable, and I could have asked a lot more questions. Really. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We thank you so much. It really was. We thank her for coming. I you know you've got to go now, so it's a little bit after twenty after, so you'll get you know. Thank you again so very much. A pleasure.